Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have your attention, please. Sorry for disturbing your conversation, but we're anxious to get started with the ambassador. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Neve King. I'm the Vice President for Programs and Strategic Content here at the Council, and we're delighted to welcome back Ambassador Peter Vidig. Welcome back. Welcome in Chicago. We're delighted to have you. And also a special thanks to the staff at the German Embassy in Washington, and of course to the Consulate here, Consul General Herbert Kvela and his staff. Thank you for all the great partnerships. We're on the record and live streaming, but please silence your phones, so as you're taking them out to silence them, you may add to your calendar the following upcoming events, um, since you're all Euro-interested in the room. On Thursday, October 5th, we'll be hosting one of our fantastic half-day symposium. We're doing it on the future of transatlantic relations. We've got some terrific people in from Washington, from Germany, from all over to talk about this. It'll take start at 8 in the morning, end at 1. Uh, we're doing it with Chatham House, as I mentioned. And um, so, for example, the uh, EU ambassador to the UN will be here and various other guests. And then also on Tuesday, October 17th, we'll be welcoming Anne Applebaum back to the Council. She'll be talking with uh, Evo, our president, on Russia, Ukraine, and the fate of Europe's borderlands. And now just back to today's meeting, uh, a brief disclaimer, for nearly a century, the Council has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices, and the views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Now just a few words about Ambassador Vidic. He took up the job as German Ambassador to the United States in April 2014. He's previously served as German ambassador to the United Nations in New York, a fitting week to have had that job, and represented Germany during its tenure as a member of the UN Security Council in 2011 and 2012. Prior to his career in the German Foreign Service, he studied at Bonn, Freiburg, Canterbury, and Oxford, and also taught as a professor at the University of Freiburg. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Wittig to the stage. Thank you, Neam, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here. Um, since there's no such thing as a free lunch, I guess I have to work hard to earn uh, that um, excellent food here. And let me say, uh, first of all, what a great honor it is to speak here in Chicago. Here at the, one of the oldest think tanks um, covering global issues in the United States, back in February 1922, when isolationism was on the rise, when so many Americans thought it was time to focus entirely on the home front and turn away from the world, a world that soon destabilized uh, after World War I and cried out for leadership. At that time, some clairvoyant Chicagoans founded this council, and um, that is still a reason to applaud. How much have times changed and how much haven't they? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, uh, as Mark Twain once said. And whether he was right or not, what could be more thrilling and um, exciting and in sometimes scary than um, present day foreign and security policy? It has leading politicians, <laughs> leading analysts, a virtually waxing poetic, a world in turmoil, that's how my foreign minister has called it, um, a world in disarray, that's the title of the book of Richard Haas, a friend of mine, and possibly the gloomiest description I heard la at last Munich security conference, a Hobbesian state of nature. Um, no doubt our world um, order is under stress. Ladies and gentlemen, this trend is not sparing Europe or the US. Both this year and last year, a strong return of nationalism and populism has occurred. In Europe, we've seen a quite an EU hostile campaign in France, in other European countries, rising, rising Euro skepticism in many other European countries. With Brexit, uh, we have seen successful campaigns which were largely driven by uh, nationalist-inspired fears. In the US, we have been able to observe a similar dynamic. So um, this is um, the situation in, in terms of rising isolationism and nationalism. Globally, 
North Korean aggression is making not only that country, uh, that country's neighbors nervous, but pretty much the entire international community holds its breath. At the same time, the fight against terrorism um, and for stability in the Middle East is far from over, despite heavy losses of the Islamic State, the so-called Islamic State. And also in Eastern Europe, and especially in the Ukraine, um, there continues to be um, a, a serious conflict. So this instability and the crises of the post-Cold War order have again, in our case, raise the question of Germany's role in the world, a question that has continued to grow in relevance during recent months and years. In 2014, The Economist magazine called Germany the reluctant hegemon, and our European neighbors indeed who worried most of the 20th century about a Germany that is too powerful and too aggressive more or less gently now criticize us for not taking enough responsibility in the world. And also in Germany, there's an ongoing, uh, quite lively uh, debate about our role, especially as more and more Germans are beginning to realize that the problems of a globalized world, be it terrorism, be it migration, will not st stop at our doorstep. So what should German leadership look like? And we'll see um, a result uh, of this debate, uh, not exactly uh, next Sunday, but it has been reflected also in our election campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, despite our world in crisis, we are luckier than previous generations. We have a strong uh, international framework of rules and norms and institutions to build on and the international order is what makes us more resilient against the crises that arise and better equipped to solve them. Germany as a country surrounded by nine neighbors and an economy uh, dependent on few, as few others on international open markets is a beneficiary of that rule-based international order. And it's therefore particularly dedicated to multilateral institutions. It can only exist embedded in these partnerships. So let me elaborate a little bit on three alliances uh, that are and will be the foundation of our engagement in the world. First, the European Union, second, NATO, and then our transatlantic relationship. So number one, uh, the European Union. To Germany, the EU is much more than just a single market, as important an achievement that is, a single market of 508 million people. It's much more than an economic club. We see the EU as the most successful peace project in the history of Europe. It has turned a divided continent more or less at war with itself over centuries into a beacon of peace, democracy, stability, and prosperity. It has overcome dictatorships in Spain, Portugal, and Greece, as well as communism in Eastern Europe. Brexit, to be clear, has sent shockwaves through the European Union. Uh, skepticism about the Union is more widespread among the people in Europe than some years ago, although it has been receding somewhat in, in, in the recent um, couple of months. So there's no denying the union is not in the strongest of shapes. It is clear we have to make sure that we tackle the important problems of Europe and take action where it is urgently needed. This includes the areas of migration and external borders. It includes internal, external security, as well as economic and social development, especially for the young people. With the election of uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, we have, as I see it, as we see it, a new window of opportunity, a new leadership team 
France and Germany, and I know this is not enough uh, to lead in the European Union. You have to take everybody along. It's more or less a collective effort, but you need um, sometimes a vanguard. And with this new leadership team between France and Germany, we can move the EU towards reform, towards more competitiveness, towards more economic and monetary coherence, towards a stronger defense union. With regard to Brexit, we have to make sure that we have continued close cooperation and economic integration with the UK. Whatever arrangement uh, we may decide upon, our interest as Germans is to have as close and uh, friendly relations with the UK as possible. But there can be no uh, concessions on the four freedom of the single market, which are part and parcel of that achievement, uh, the single European market. Britain, and I think we made this clear um, in also many words, cannot cherry pick the elements it likes and discards those of which it approves. And we will have some tough negotiations ahead, that's for sure. Brexit, I would say, is a classic lose-lose proposition. It is nefarious for the European Union, but uh, it is the UK, to my mind, that will lose the most. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU is the backbone for Germany and its engagement in the world. But it's not an alliance of collective defense, that is NATO. And this is my, my second point. Only together with NATO can we face the th current threat of international crises. NATO plays a key role in providing security in Eastern Europe. Russian efforts to meddle, I'm not speaking um, about the annexation of Crimea and uh, the uh, continuing crisis in Eastern Ukraine, that's of course very high on our agenda. But recently, Russian efforts to meddle in the election processes and weaken democratic societies in its vicinity and in Europe as a whole threaten freedom, stability, and economic prosperity gained since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So how to deal with Russia? Germany, I think, brings a strong hand to the table. Chancellor Merkel is the Western leader who has the closest contact um, with President Putin and who talks to him regularly and in a very straightforward and candid way. They speak each other's language, as you know, and that helps. Germany advocates engaging with Moscow. We would welcome efforts to ease tensions, uh, to help solve regional conflicts, and in the end, to reestablish beneficial economic relations that we had before the sanctions regime. But we have to keep the focus on the security needs of our Eastern European and uh, Ukrainian allies. So what we need to do is twofold. Engage Russia on the one hand and stay determined and resolute about our security needs on the other hand. So it's dialogue and defense. But NATO must also go beyond this and we know that we've been a partner and that we are a partner with, the US, with this U.S. administration uh, for um, an extension of the COP scope of NATO beyond the Eastern challenge, uh, we have to respond to new and emerging challenges, challenges emanating from the south, south um, of um, the European continent, namely the Middle East and North Africa. Developments in NATO's southern neighborhood are and have directly affected the security of the US and Europe. The spread of ISIL has led to numerous ISIL-inspired terrorist attacks in Europe and in America, and it threatens our common way of life. So NATO is acting on this, although some would say it has reacted um, a little bit belatedly, yet the alliance has made clear that it will help bring greater stability to the Middle Eastern region. It will do so mainly by aiming to project stability. It's not such a question to 
bring many boots on the ground in that region. We know we can't uh, win with massive um, boots on the ground. We have to empower um, our allies from the region um, and uh, build defense capability, advising and training them as we did with the Kurds in, in northern Iraq in their fight against ISIL. Germany is strongly engaged in NATO missions, um, financially as well with um, manpower. Nevertheless, the question of burden sharing has reemerged. Uh, this president has uh, really made it um, a recurring theme. It's a legitimate uh, theme and a legitimate issue. And it's not just the new administration that has expressed the view that my country and others in NATO um, contribute too little to NATO. Europe and Germany can and must provide more leadership and more resources. Uh, that has been affirmed uh, by Chancellor Merkel uh, in her talks to uh, President Trump. And Germany is indeed prepared to take more uh, responsibility. We have um, increased our defense budget in the last year by 9%, and we will follow this path of gradually, as the NATO decisions say, gradually increasing our spending on defense. We're also among the NATO countries um, leading troops on the ground to reassure Poland and Baltic countries um, uh, against the uh, Ru Russian hybrid warfare against the Russian threat. We are continuing our engagement with the second largest troop contributor in Afghanistan, shoulder to shoulder with um, American troops. So there's no doubt about it. In the end, a strong NATO force that is capable of responding to war and terror and solving crises requires adequate resources and money. Our vital interest is in a strong NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, I come uh, to my last point, uh, the transatlantic relationship. Neither uh, Germany nor even the US as the leading world power will be able to tackle today's global crises alone. Our nations need to act jointly, resolutely, at times robustly, for our own sake and for our role as major players in an increasingly globalized world, we need that's our firm belief. We need to choose cooperation over isolation. And if we don't do this, and if we don't engage, and if we go back to thinking in exclusively national terms, other nations will come will, and will be more happy to take over our role and shape international politics. Especially on the trade and economic front, on issues related to trade and uh, um, economic affairs, this president is particularly outspoken in defending American business against perceived unfair foreign competition in its effort to create a level playing field. We're having an ongoing discussion uh, with this administration on the merits of free trade, as you know. One of the first steps uh, that, that, that is well known of the Trump administration was to scrap the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. We were not part of it. I'm not commenting. People say, observers say, especially Asian observers say, uh, this um, was a geostrategic move uh, that um, is to the detriment of American uh, uh, clout in the region. The WTO, an organization founded on strong American initiative and crucial for fair and open trade, the World Trade Organization, is being called into questions by some member, uh, into called into question by some members of this administration. The administration has called for renegotiation of NAFTA. Will this be an overdue and legitimate uh, and sensible modernization of NAFTA? Will it uh, be a fundamental change or will the president uh, make good on his repeated threats to withdraw from the agreement altogether? An open question, ambitious timeline until the end of the year. 
uh, my country and our businesses are watching this very closely. It might be a kind of litmus test um, what this administration um, will do with free trade. Steel imports could be reduced under um, the guise of being a national security threat. And the long planned border adjustment tax that was looming large on the horizon of Congress to our relief appears for the time being to be off the table. But the notion of using various tools to make imports more expensive and domestic products cheaper is alive and well. All these deliberations, as we see it, um, carry a risk. If implemented, they will trigger counter response from the other side of the Atlantic, and in the worst case, uh, will start a trade war. And this is the least thing I think we have an interest in. Also, a look at the statistics makes clear that the notion of trade as a zero-sum game does not hold up to reality. American companies are invested in Europe. Nearly every European company produces in the US, often in economically challenging, challenged regions. In our case, uh, more than 3,000 German companies are active here in the US. They have been creating in the manufacturing sector 700,000 well-paying jobs for Americans. BMW is with their production lines here in the US, the biggest exporter of the American automotive industry in value. So there is a contribution of European and, and German firms to this economy. Um, and um, our economies have become so closely interwoven that our countries, as we see, mutual, mutually benefit. With regard to foreign and security politics, there seems to be less disruption than in the trade field. Leading administration officials have underlined the importance of NATO repeatedly. In the conflict of North Korea, action has been taken to counter uh, North Korean aggressive, aggressiveness in close cooperation with uh, regional powers and including in international bodies. Enhanced sanctions imposed by the UN uh, Security Council, um, although a first um, step, um, testify to that international cooperation. As far as the nuclear deal with Iran is concerned, so far it remains in place. The agreement uh, which we co-negotiated uh, together with China, Russia, and of course UK and France, um, we think um, is a good deal. Uh, because uh, it uh, provides for the most intrusive, comprehensive inspection regime and has contained um, Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon. However, as you have noticed yesterday, um, President Trump is sounding more and more skeptical um, about remaining committed to this deal, and this is indeed for us a worrying, worrying development. Also, the termination of the Paris Climate Change um, Agreement, a truly global agreement, including nearly all nations of the globe, um, as we all know, was rebuffed um, by the termination uh, or the rebuff of, of that Paris Agreement, we thought uh, was a mistake. Um, it um, fuels fears that uh, the U.S. abdicated its global, or was abdicating its global leadership role in important um, international um, fields. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me close. Um, there is a compelling reason why Germany and the United States have been such close allies over time. Our societies are closely connected. Our peoples linked through various personal relationships. We share, the societies share broadly the same values. And this broad common basis is something unique, but it's not a given. It needs to be cultivated and filled with life, continuously. And this, of course, has not always been easy with some 
skeptical rhetoric across the Atlantic on both sides of the Atlantic with such with some disagreements uh, that have emerged. But the past few months have also shown something else. The commonalities we share, especially between our private sectors, this wonderful landscape of important businesses, our civil societies, academia, our peoples, organizations on both sides of the Atlantic, organizations like your Council on Global Affairs. This remains a stable and solid cornerstone of our transatlantic friendship, a cornerstone that is needed now than ever. I thank you for your attention and I would enjoy a discussion with you if time permits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now we'd like to go out to you for questions. If you could please raise your arm, wait for the mic, and make sure the question's a question. We can start over here with Mr. Jim Stone, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, what is uh, Germany's policy on international cyber spying and cyber warfare and counter cyber activities. And an add on, uh, what advice could you give the United States government on cyber reality? Well, cyber is one of the great uh, emerging fields of uh, national security policy. It's, uh, Cyber attacks, cyber warfare are one of the emerging, great emerging threats in our modern <clears throat> world. I think we um, are on a steep learning curve. Um, our businesses, uh, how to protect uh, themselves, our governments, uh, our societies. Uh, and that is a day-to-day -day challenge where we have to improve and work to improve every day. I'm not so sure whether um, I, as a German, or my government uh, can give an advice uh, to the U.S. I think uh, this is a field where the U.S. is a leader, not only in the IT, but also in cyber defense. I would rather say we probably can learn from the U.S. more than vice versa, although I don't exclude uh, that um, we, we develop good technologies that we can share um, with, with the U.S. It, you know, it's a, it, it's a mainstream threat that uh, permeates, that pervades probably all walks of digital life. But in the field of uh, defense and security policy, it is uh, one of the most uh, vital threats to our security. There is a whole architecture that is emerging in each and every country. For instance, our um, armed forces have now sort of established their own domain. There is a cyber defense force um, that you know has been created, uh, I think, last year by our um, defense minister. Um, we have a um, cyber center uh, housed in Berlin um, to to protect the government facilities against cyber attacks. And each and every major business has uh, taken precautions. And yet, um, we cannot be sure that tomorrow um, vital installations, be the banks or be it utilities, are victims of an attack. So um, I would say this is um, a common threat we have. There are some international um, countries or actors where we know that this threat is emerging from, um, and we have to be vigilant. But I, I would not um, see that we have a blueprint here, that we have a, a magic wand. It's an evolving threat, and I think our defense has to be evolving as well, and hopefully um, more advanced than the threat is. Thanks. Uh, next question, Phil Levy, please, our senior fellow on the global economy. Thank you, Ambassador. I wanted to ask you about uh, German leadership and trade. The, we're over 20 years now since we had the last major global 
trade deal mm -hmm. uh, with the Uruguay Round. There was some push to do this with Doha. It didn't work. There was a U.S. vision where you might link up what you mentioned with TPP and TTIP. That seems to be stalled. Is there an alternative version where, say, Germany and Europe play a leadership role? They've been very active in trade agreements, but something that sets new global standards on trade. Yeah. Well, the WTO is the global trade forum, as you know. Um, I think um, those fora need, um, uh, you know, constant adjustment and reform. And there, there is a, a ministerial conference coming up uh, shortly of all the WTO members. And I know that this administration is very mindful that the WTO changes substantially. And we would not deny that the WTO is in need of change, but we would still regard it as an important framework for world trade. And we see it with a critical eye uh, when uh, the WTO um, is meant to be sidelined. Now, you mentioned uh, this Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, in short, TTIP, that we worked on uh, during the Obama administration. Um, there was resistance in, in, in both sides of the Atlantic, also in my own country, emerging from basically the civil society. Um, it, had not, it was not so much really um, against free trade as such, but um, uh, very active civil society groups sort of fueled fears that were related to uh, genetically modified um, organisms or food, or um, th there was, you know, like uh, data protection played a role. Um, and then it, it, we, we couldn't manage to um, finish it during the Obama administration, so it kind of stalled. Now, this, with this administration, it's interesting. Um, there is an interest of this administration to take up, um, stretch out feelers, uh, talk about a possible uh, trade arrangement between the two major trading blocks in the world. Uh, I'm not so sure whether the time is right for that, um, but there are exploratory contacts between um, the commissioner who is in charge, uh, Cecilia Malmström. We have pooled, as you know, our national sovereignties is one of the fields where the EU really has 100% authority over our trade policy. So it is, in a way, a bilateral relationship uh, if they negotiate again. Um, so, so there is an interest to explore what we can do together. My feeling is the, the political circumstances have to be right on both sides of the Atlantic. It would have to be relabeled. I don't think we can have an, you know, another T-tip. And I think we would have also to learn from previous experiences. Uh, we can't do trade negotiations in, in back rooms, seclusive um, you know, back room deals, at least in the perception of, the, uh, of the, our peoples. Uh, they want to know what's going on. And, um, we will have to be more transparent in future about the issues and maybe less ambitious. Um, I, I, I could imagine on a personal level that we could really advance when it comes to regulatory cooperation, not so much on tariffs, but all on standards, norms, certification procedure. That is what matters a lot to businesses. It's not only tariffs, but it's those things. And why not um, tr try it again, maybe on a different um, roof, on a different, um, with different ambition level when the time is right? Yeah, the gentleman right here, please, at the middle table with the glasses. Thanks for being here, Mr. Ambassador. Um, some months ago, perhaps a year ago, the economist Joe Stiglitz uh, came to the council to discuss um, his prescriptions for ensuring the continued viability of the euro. I think some included things such as centralizing depository insurance and, and the like. Uh, my question is, um, what sort of reforms does Chancellor Merkel plan to uh, push for, if any, in the medium term to ensure the euro's continuing viability? I don't think I have understood this well acoustically. 
Um, what was this about? I, 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 what was, I, I just understood insurance. Oh, so, so my question is, is what reforms does, does Chancellor Merkel plan to push for to ensure the euro's continuing oh, viability? the euro? Yes, the euro. Yeah. Um, well, I can't anticipate um, what uh, the next chancellor uh, will um, do on European reform. Uh, that would be um, a little bit too risky for me here um, three days before the elections. Um, but uh, the, the, the euro is one of our assets in Europe. The other asset is the single market. Um, the euro has weathered storms. Uh, I remember um, having met in New York uh, m many people from Wall Street who um, put their money on the wrong horse and um, really predicted that the euro would go down the drains uh, in, in the various Greek um, debt crises. It has survived all the storms. It's pretty, it's on the rise. Um, to the delight, um, um, you know, of uh, American, um, you know, those who are watching our trade surplus, um, and maybe uh, to the dismay of, of exporters from Europe uh, uh, to, to America. Um, I, I think the major issue um, in in the future will be for Europe. Um, how do we harmonize better? the monetary union that we have with 19 <coughs> countries of the European Union and the economic uh, and fiscal policies that are less harmonized. And many economists say that was sort of the, the birth defect of, of the euro, uh, that um, you know, the harmonization of economic and fiscal policies did not um, uh, happen as fast and, and as thoroughly as the monetary policy. So that's the conundrum I think that we will have to face in the, in the coming years. Um, and I know that there are, um, are various models for that. Macron, the pre new French president, has come forward saying we, we, knew the, we need our own euro budget, we need our own euro finance minister, my finance minister, not my, our German finance minister, Mr. Schäuble, has suggested to create a European monetary fund. Those are all ideas that um, go into that direction, uh, strengthening economic, fiscal, and monetary cohesion in the European Union. So what comes out of that, um, it's too early to tell. Uh, that is a question that will, you know, keeping us uh, busy as observers and as policymakers in the next month after th those elections. The only thing I can say on a general level, um, I think uh, Europe uh, has now, after the shock of Brexit, and, um, you know, I, I would go as far as to say the cohesion of Europe as a whole has been strengthened by two things, basically, by Brexit and, and by the election of, of President Trump. Now, the, the Europeans now are, um, I think, uh, more willing than they have been maybe two years ago uh, to pull this out together and, and, and to push uh, forward to, to reform. And I think we have now this opportunity with uh, a new leadership in France uh, that has made it very clear that it wants wants to advance, it wants to play an active role in reforming not only France, but also um, the European Union and the German leader. Um, and if they find common ground, I, I have a lot of hope uh, that um, Europe will be advanced towards more competitiveness, towards monetary and economic and fiscal cohesion, and also towards uh, a more cohesive defense uh, union and uh, defense policy in Europe. Ah, uh, yeah, the second gentleman at that table, please. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is in terms of health care. Sorry, could you speak into the mic, please? It's hard to hear you. I'm Thanks. Sorry. In terms of health care in Germany itself and its health care system, has the growth in dollars spent or in euros spent 
uh, been at the same increase level as the United States? And at the same time, does the social system in terms of providing care, is it adequate to the point where people don't buy private insurance as they do in some of the other European countries? Well, that's a, um, a wide field. Um, I, I, can, I can say that um, the health uh, people are spending in Germany 9% of the GDP on health. In the US, it's more than 17. So um, I, I think we are better off as a consumer, as a recipient of um, the medical system, and we spend less on, 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 on health care. And I would claim for us it has worked. I mean, I would not be um, here wanting to um, engage in a mission for our uh, health system. Every country has to decide that for itself. You know, for us, I think uh, uh, healthcare has been solved in a way, or the question of how far healthcare should go has been solved um, in the 19th century by Bismarck. You know, he introduced um, the, the health care insurance and, and the unemployment insurance. So with, with that, those measures, measures in the 80s, by the way, he, he, his main, I think his main um, intention was to keep the socialists down, uh, you know. And it was, this was not all altruism. But I think the question, can or should a society exercise solidarity and should it accept a measure of redistribution of wealth by means of those insurances was settled very early in the day, whereas this country is still wrestling uh, with, with those more larger questions. So our, I think our health care system is a mix between um, public um, health care, health care, of um, uh, businesses and private health care. Uh, so I, for instance, um, I'm insured by my employer, but I have, have on top of that, for me and my family, I have a private health insurance as well. Um, and, and that's a combination that many people have. Next question. Are there any ladies with questions? Well, John de Blasio, I'll call on you, so. <laughs> I'm close enough, Neve. <laughs> But uh, can you talk a little bit about Ukraine? Um, what is your perception of American policy towards Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? And then also, where do you see the differences in the alliance uh, with respect to how to approach Russia uh, in Ukraine? Mm. Yes. Um, you know, the annexation of the Crimea, uh, the trouble the conflict in eastern Ukraine in 2014, that was sort of a, a pivotal moment, a landmark uh, in the post-war history. And in a way, it was the end of the post-Cold War order. So for us in Europe, it's hard to overestimate the shock that that created. Um, the Russian president decided to redraw the map that had never happened before um, in that way um, since 1945. So it, 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 it was a, a really a, a incredibly decisive moment. Shortly afterwards, the chancellor, uh, with the help of the French president, engaged um, and created that so-called Normandy format where the four leaders um, got together, German leader, French leader, Russian leader, Ukrainian leader, and created what we call the Minsk process. A very elaborate process with various bodies and sub-bodies and a roadmap and a plan of benchmarks. Um, that did not resolve the conflict. After uh, three years, uh, we still are uh, in, in, we still have a, in Eastern Ukraine a, a simmering conflict. Some would say it's a frozen conflict. Um, but it did some, something else. It prevented that this conflict turned into a hot war. And there was 
along the way, there were some moments where there was a real danger that we would see a hot war between Russia and, and the Ukrainian uh, army. And so that, I think, the Minsk process prevented that. But the glass is half full, half empty. That's this kind of proposition here. And we have an interest that the US engages. Uh, the Obama administration was cautious. Um, um, and and uh, we were very much in sync uh, with um, the leading foreign and security policy officials. We consulted very closely. But um, the president uh, at that time decided uh, not to weigh in with um, heavy, uh, be it military or diplomatic contributions. And I think this president also, uh, and especially uh, Secretary Tillerson, who is leading um, that dossier, uh, also wanted to, first of all, get acquainted uh, with, with the situation and then weigh very carefully what the role of the US um, in, in that conflict resolution process should be. And I dare say they still have not come to a definite conclusion uh, how much and, and what kind of role and how much importance they should uh, attribute to uh, their specific contribution. Um, there is now, um, and I think we, we were very much in favor of that, there is now a special envoy, uh, Ambassador Kurt uh, Volker, uh, appointed by, um, um, by the President and serving uh, Secretary Tillerson, who, who, who is sort of horizon scanning. Um, and uh, Rex Tillerson has said, uh, we stick to the Minsk process unless we come up with a better idea and with a better forum. So um, here we are, and my response to your question is, I think uh, we see an increased interest in conflict resolution and in an American contribution to that, but we have not yet gauged um, and there is no, I think, final conclusion as to what the contribution and um, sort of the priority of, the, of the, this administration will be as far as the Ukraine uh, conflict is concerned. I know, and this is positive, uh, that uh, they're having, uh, this administration is having conversations with the Russian side, of course, with the Ukrainian side, and, and that's a good sign. Uh, and I think, this is, has always been our philosophy. Don't cut off the channels of communication with Moscow, rather do the opposite. Uh, we have to be patient, we have to be thinking in the long haul, there's no easy um, peace to win with Russia, but uh, we have to engage in a dialogue and I think that is what um, this administration is currently doing. Yeah, Mr. Frank Chow, please, right there. Thank you for your fine presentation, Mr. Ambassador. My question is this. Germany has recently committed to spend 2% of its GDP on defense uh, during a period of the next several years. We know that German influence on the continent is very, very important. What is Germany doing to encourage other European countries to do the same? Well, um, I think the other countries don't need our encouragement. Um, because there is a decision, or two decisions, of two NATO summits in 2014 in Wales and 2016 in Warsaw. The leaders get together every two years. So those are the summits that decided to, and that was also a reaction to the Russian aggression in, in Ukraine, and to that what I phrase the end of the post-Cold War order, decided to increase their defense spending. And they said, uh, we pledge to move towards the 2% goal, 2% of GDP in defense spending um, until 2024. So it was, in 2014, it was a 10-year timeline. And this is what we pledged, and this is what all countries pledged. Now, out of those 29 members of NATO, the recent member is Montenegro. We are, we are now in 29. I think only five are um, sort of 
complying with that uh, goal. Um, the others are underachievers, so to speak, uh, my country among them. Um, and I think we all are on our track uh, to fulfill in that timeline our goal. You know, I, I, maybe I say some words to explain sort of the mindset of, 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 of this uh, topic or of, of my country vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, burden sharing. I think there's no, nobody who denies that we need a fairer burden sharing here. But, um, you know, my country comes from a certain history of, um, uh, let's say, aversion against anything military. You know, after the Second World War, most people thought we will never want to have an army again. That changed in 1955, whether in the, at the height of the Cold War, when the Americans and other NATO countries said, you have to be co-opted here. You have to be NATO members. You have to have an army too. So the Germans reluctantly joined NATO in, in 55. And then when, the, uh, when we had a huge army, 500,000. Now when unification occurred and sort of everybody thought now peace is breaking out, everybody thought, okay, we have to have a dividend. Do we still need 500,000 soldiers for territorial defense at the German-Polish, German-Hungarian border when those countries became friends? So there was this peace dividend and we drew down. And um, that was the mindset of the people. Now that changed in 2014, but you cannot um, say to the public opinion or to parliament for that matter, and parliament in our case is decides. We have a parliamentary army for historical reasons. We don't have a president who can say, okay, tomorrow uh, I'll, I'll send 10,000 of you to Iraq or wherever. <laughs> And we need a mandate for that. So do you have to convince parliament and, and the public opinion in anything you do. If you say tomorrow we need to fulfill the 2% goal and pay X billion more, you, you, it just wouldn't fly in our country. So you need that incremental approach and you need to convince public opinion and parliament that this is the right thing to do. And that is a, so that's a struggle for, for the leadership but the leadership is engaged in that struggle. So I'm confident that we will stick to our obligation and pledge to do this. Just not in a big bang, but incrementally. So Ambassador, if we could end on a slightly forward-looking question. Um, you talked about the reluctant hegemon, 2014. If you were to look two years from now, five years from them, what might you expect the headline in The Economist would be about Germany? Neither hegemon nor reluctant. Uh, yeah. that, 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 that would be a good, uh, good headline, and because we don't want to be a, a hegemon, and it doesn't work uh, in, in Europe. I think this is over where, where there were hegemons, uh, but uh, we don't want to be a reluctant leader. We know we have leadership responsibilities, but in consort with others. The EU is a, is a unique animal. We are not the United States of Europe. Um, we are uh, um, you know, a, a union, and not a fully fledged union. We, we are sort of a assembly of 28, soon to be 27, um, you know, sovereign nations with their own traditions and their own particularities. Uh, in some areas, like in trade, we pooled our sovereignties in some areas. We, we have retained the sovereignty. It's very difficult to convey the, or, or, you know, to, to familiar, familiarize the U.S. Le, you know, leaders or experts or people with that strange animal. Um, so we um, need to have everybody on board. And this is something sometimes cumbersome. We are a union consisting of big countries, small countries, medium-sized countries, in the end, everybody has to be taken along. It usually takes longer, the decision-making process, but when we decide and we prove that, in the face of crisis, we usually emerge stronger. And as far as Brexit is concerned, it really 
grieved us, it hurt us, it shocked us. Uh, we, we were really, you know, we, we ha had the feeling this is a tremendous loss. But in the end, it'll make us uh, a stronger European Union. Maybe the willing matrix manager. Be happy, willing to do it, get everyone together. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you for your comments. And thanks to the audience for the great questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much to the ambassador and his team.